Well, what a special place this is today to be together with so many like-minded brothers and sisters in the Lord to have heard what we heard this morning in the unfolding of Isaiah chapter 53. And what I want to do now is to stand on the shoulders of that message that we heard from Isaiah 53, which so powerfully and passionately proclaimed the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ uh, upon the cross. And I want to ask you, where do you stand in relationship to the cross? It's one thing for you to be in this building, and it's something else for you to be in Christ. It is one thing for you to have gotten in line outside to come in, and it's something else for you to be in line behind Jesus Christ and following Him. And so, today, I want to stand at the gate. I want to stand at the narrow gate and urge and call many of you to come through the narrow gate. And I want us to look at a text of Scripture today that will outline for us and speak very directly to what it is to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ. Not to be merely a church member and not to be merely a conference attender, but what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? Every true Christian, every born-again believer is a disciple of Jesus Christ. And today I want to clarify what is it to be a disciple and a follower of Jesus Christ. And I want to urge you and call you, if you've never yet become a disciple of Christ, to come to the cross and to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Probably most of us here today have already surrendered our lives to Christ. And I want to urge us who have come through the narrow gate and who are going down the narrow path, I want to encourage us to be all the more resilient in our faith and all the more radically committed to the Lordship of Christ. There's not a one of us in this room today who are too committed to Christ. Every one of us who have already surrendered our lives to Christ need to be even more resolved to follow Jesus Christ. And so my text of Scripture that I want to begin by reading is in the Gospel of Luke, if you would take God's Word and turn with me to Luke chapter 14. And today I want to speak to you on the cost of discipleship or it will cost you everything. Luke chapter 14, I want to begin reading in verse 25, and I want to set this before your eyes and before your heart, and I want you to be engaged with what our Lord Jesus says in these verses. Luke 14, 25. Now, large crowds would be like what we find ourselves in today. Large crowds, plural. It speaks of just hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, were going along with Him. And He turned and said to them, If anyone comes to Me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children... And brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. The one who issues the call sets the terms. And we are not allowed to negotiate on the terms. He says in verse 27, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me, cannot be my disciple. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? 
Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it will begin to ridicule him, saying, this man, this man began to build and was not able to finish. In a former life, many years ago, I used to play college football. I played college football for four years at Texas Tech University. It's nice to know who the elect are. (laughs) After all, Bobby Knight is our college coach uh, in basketball, so we have very high spiritual standards. And I remember during the spring of my senior year in high school, I was given a full football scholarship, which paid for everything. The only person happier than me was my father. (laughs) For the next four years, everything was paid in full. My tuition was free. My books were free. As many tutors as I wanted for four years were free. My room was free, my meals were free, my laundry was free, every plane flight to an out-of-town game was free, every bus ride to a stadium was free. My Corvette was... No, they didn't give me a Corvette. (laughs) I feel like I'm CJ now, you know? <laughs> and for the next four years, everything in my life as it related to college was paid in full. It didn't cost me a cent. All my laundry was free. As many steaks I, as I could eat were free. Everything was free. And for the next four years, it cost me everything. It began with two-a-day practices in August, and it would be 105 degrees in West Texas. We had just put down an artificial grass field, and you could stand on one end zone, and in 105, that, that gridiron became like a, a skillet. You could stand on one goal line and look at the goal post on the other end of our stadium, and you could barely even see the goal post for all of the heat that was rising. Off-season conditioning was, 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 was mind-boggling. The coaches would literally kill us. If you ever missed class, you were there at 6 a.m. in the morning. You're running the stadium stairs every kind of weightlifting, every kind of gymnastics. In fact, we even fought with each other and climbed ropes and, and on and on and two days in, in spring training and then coming out early. And, and the easiest part of those four years was during the season. And you would just give yourself to completely. I, I even went to the doctor last week. I lost my voice and he numbed my nose and put a Uh, like a telescope down my nose to look at my vocal cords. And as he did it, he said, well, your nose is broken. And I said, my nose has never been broken. He said, trust me. He said, your nose is broken. And I thought back to those many practices and how many times I was hit so hard that I was just numb that I couldn't even feel another hit. And, And who knows, I spent one semester on crutches. Uh, there, there was a de- there was a s- semester I couldn't even go to class some days because I was so hurt and and so banged up. In my education, everything for four years was paid in full. It was free, and the fact of the matter is, it cost me blood, toil, sweat, and tears. It cost me everything that was in me as I would sacrifice and radically give myself to this cause of football. I want you to know that's exactly the way it is to be a Christian. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying here. 
that when he went to the cross, as CJ so wonderfully laid out for us, he went to the cross, God took our sins, God transferred them to the innocent Lamb of God, and he bore our sins in his body, and the Father crushed him upon the cross, and Jesus shed his blood and made an atonement for our sin, and at the end he said, it is finished, to Telestai, and he paid in full the entirety of our sin debt, and there is not one thin dime you can bring to the cross and contribute anything to your eternal salvation. But you need to understand the terms for receiving the free gift. Because if you are to receive the free gift, here's what it's going to cost you. It's going to require the total commitment of all that you are to the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are some of you here today who think you are saved. And the fact is, you are really not. And all you've done is walk an aisle, raise a hand, sign a card, show up at a Bible study, show up at a conference, but the fact of the matter is, you've never done business with God. And you have never come to the intersection of life and have never come to the place where you're ready to give the entirety of who you are to Jesus Christ, and it is only then that you are able to receive the free gift. And for those of you here today who have not yet become a true bona fide disciple of Jesus Christ, I want you to see what Jesus says regarding how to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And for the rest of us who, are, who have come through the narrow gate and we have committed our lives to Christ, we need to understand that as we walk in a manner worthy of our calling, it requires that we deepen our commitment to Christ. That's precisely what Jesus is saying here. And what Christ says in verse 26 and in verse 27, these terms are non-negotiable. These terms are absolute. These terms are fixed and set. These terms are unalterable, and they are the same for every one of us. Jesus never tried to induce the crowd to follow him. Jesus never tried to manipulate decisions. Jesus never sugar-coated the message. Jesus never kept the hard part in fine print where we couldn't locate it. Jesus never softened the requirement. Jesus never marked down the price for following Him. And every one of us here today need to do some serious soul-searching is verse 26 and is verse 27 true of my life? And so this morning, I want us to consider what it is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. In verse 25, he says, large crowds were going along with him. These were huge crowds. And one thing we need to understand, it's easy to be a part of a crowd. It's easy to get in line. In fact, the larger the crowd, the easy it is to be inconspicuous and to just blend in, and the easier it is to simply just ride the wave and ride the momentum without ever having to make an individual personal commitment to Jesus Christ with your own life. And our Lord understood that. There is a crowd mentality. There is a movement mentality. People want to be where people are. And the bigger the crowd, the more other people want to be in that crowd. And how easy it is for people to come be a part of a crowd. And the crowds here with our Lord in verse 25, they are growing, they are swelling, they are exploding, they are multiplying, but our Lord is not deceived because He does not measure success in the ministry by the size of the crowd. And our Lord now stops and does something that no doubt to the disciples was shocking. 
In verse 25, it says, large crowds were going along with him, and he turned. The idea is he stopped, and he turned around and spoke to them. And he knew now that the crowd had become a mixed bag. Even within his own 12 disciples, it was a mixed bag. There was one who was not converted, Judas. And with a crowd this large, our Lord knew that not only were there those who were committed, but there were others who were merely curious. And there were others who were merely coming along. And so our Lord turned to face them directly, and what our Lord is doing is saying, in essence, stop. And he sifts through the crowd. And periodically, our Lord would do this, as if to say the crowd is getting too big. It is becoming too easy to jump on the bandwagon. It is becoming too easy to be swept up in this movement of following me. And as our Lord says this, He brings it down to an individual basis, and He puts it before them and calls for the total commitment of their soul. The key word in this text, you'll find it is the last word of verse 26. And it is the last word of verse 27. And it is also found the middle word in verse 33. And it is the word disciple. Not an attender, but a disciple. And what our Lord is longing for and what our Lord died for, He died only for disciples of Jesus Christ. Not one drop of blood was shed beyond the disciples. And it is only for His own people that He has died. So what is a disciple? It's very important for us here to know what a disciple is because it is only a disciple who is in line and following after Jesus Christ. A disciple, a true disciple, is a true believer in Jesus Christ. It is a a, a Greek word that means a learner. It is one who has come to sit at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ and to be taught by Him and become a follower of Jesus Christ. In Matthew 28, 19, go therefore into all the world and make disciples. Our Lord could care less about attenders. Our Lord is after disciples. And a disciple is in these early chapters is a true believer. In fact, the word Christian was not even coined and used in Scripture until later in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 11, and at that it was a term of derision, and it means a little Christ. And so our Lord now is issuing what are the terms of being a disciple of Christ, and what are the terms that would allow one to get in line and to follow after Him. And so what our Lord says now is, is, is shocking. What our Lord says is jolting to the crowd. And what our Lord said had such impact upon their lives. And today, I want all of us, in a sense, to be shocked as we are reminded again of what are the terms that our Lord has issued for anyone in this building to take one step in following after Him. It is a free gift that He alone has purchased upon Calvary's cross, and He gives it to us without price. But He requires of us that we come to a place of total, complete, and radical submission and surrender of our lives to Him, or according to our Lord's words, He cannot be my disciple. Our Lord puts it in the negative to have more of an impact upon our hearts. As if holding up His hands and saying, you cannot be one of my followers unless you come to this place. So I want us to walk through this text. And for some of us here today, this will be what God will use in your life 
to come to the place where you are more than a mere attender, where you are more than simply in a crowd, where you are more than simply one who is going along, coming along on the periphery, where you actually become a true blood-bought follower of Jesus Christ. And so in, I want to begin now in verse 26. And I want you to note in verse 26, a supreme devotion. A supreme devotion in order to become a true follower of Jesus Christ, one must love Him more than anyone or anything else in life. There can be no competing affections. There can be no competing allegiances. Jesus Christ must be number one in your life or you cannot get in line and follow after Christ. So, notice what Jesus says in verse 26, if anyone, and when he says if anyone, he is saying there are no exceptions to this. If anyone comes to me, and to come to Christ is a synonymous phrase for saving faith, and it inevitably leads to what we read in verse uh, 27, to come after me, all who come to me on His terms, will inevitably come after Him. And this is the inevitable connection between justification and sanctification, and true saving faith will be a lifelong commitment to follow after Christ. And so in verse 26, he says, if anyone comes to me, if anyone commits their life to me, if anyone becomes a true believer in me, in verse 26, this will inevitably lead, in verse 27, to a lifetime of coming after me. There will be no aborted disciples once entering in who will cease to follow after. And now in verse 26, he sets the terms... And we need to re be reminded of what these terms are. This, in verse 26, is our Lord's clarification of true saving faith. It's not all that He has to say about true saving faith. There are so many other texts, but this is part and parcel of true saving faith at the beginning as well, continuation of one's Christian life. If anyone comes to me and does not hate. And that word just leaps off the page, does it not? It sounds so harsh. It sounds so offensive. It sounds so fanatical. And yet it is so true because it is spoken from the lips of the one who died upon the cross to purchase and secure our eternal salvation. If anyone comes to me and does not hate, and he begins now by speaking to those relationships that are the closest to you, those relationships that we, where your closest allegiance and your closest loyalties will lie. He begins with the inner concentric circles in your life, of those people who have most loved you and those whom you most love. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, he cannot be my disciple. Listen, Jesus, if He ever spoke what He intended to say, this was it. And what does this mean, hate? Other passages of Scripture say that you are to honor your father and mother, Exodus 20, verse 12. And the Bible says we are to love even our enemies, how much more those members of our own family. Of what does he speak? Well, this is a, a, a Hebrew figure of speech that we even use in our English culture that is called hyperbole an exaggerated statement to make a point in which it is used to set love and hate side by side in order to convey this point. 
that you must love me so much more then you love the people you love the most in this world, and you must love me so much more than the things in this world that you love the most, that what you feel for me and what you feel for them, if you are in right relationship to me, the love that you have for me would cause the love that you have for them to appear to be as hate in comparison to the supreme surpassing devotion and allegiance and affection that you have for me. And we have our Lord's own inspired interpretation of this in Matthew chapter 10 and in verse 37, Jesus puts it this way, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, unquote. See, the issue is who you love the most. And to love the Lord Jesus Christ is not merely feelings. It requires the totality of who you are, mind, emotion, and will. To love Jesus Christ supremely, it begins with the mind. You can't love someone whom you do not know. You cannot love someone whom you have not drawn close to and gotten to know more about them, and it begins with the mind, and it begins with sound doctrine and theology and the presentation of Christ in the Word of God. And in order to love Jesus Christ, your mind must be enlarged and filled with the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Love for Christ never happens in a, in a vacuum. Love for Christ never happens in a mindless, mystical experience. It is with the mind that all love begins. You cannot love in a vacuum. And then it involves the heart, the affections. As you come to see the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, you behold His, His infinite holiness and His unrivaled love that He has demonstrated at the cross for us and that He has given Himself for us. Your heart comes under the influence of this and your heart is drawn and you love Him with the depths of the feelings of your heart. You cannot be a stoic. You cannot be clinical. You cannot be cold towards Christ and your own the depths of your soul. There is drawn out of it passion for Christ, affection for Christ. And then it involves the will. And Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you say you love Christ and do not walk in obedience to Him, Hey, it's just religious talk in your life. If you truly love Jesus Christ, your mind is inflamed, your heart is enlarged, and your will is engaged to commit your life, surrender your life, and trust your life to Jesus Christ. And it is a decisive choice of the will when you get down to the bottom. And when I met my wife and we got to know each other, there was mentally understanding who she is and what she is and what her background is and what her strengths are. And then there was the response in my heart to her as I was drawn to her and appreciated all of these beauties about her. But I couldn't truly say that I loved her until I stood at the front of the church and she walked down the aisle, and as a choice of my will, I surrendered my life to her and she to me. That's what it is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And how easy it is, Jesus understood, to just be in the, the anonymity of the crowd and to be caught up in the sensation and the emotion of the moment. And our Lord brings it down here to the individual and to the specific, and He calls for their absolute, total allegiance to Him. 
That's what our Lord is doing here today. God is speaking in His Son. And God is speaking to you. And God is calling you out individually. And He is calling for you to love Him more than your father, more than your mother, more than your brother, more than your sister. And then He goes for the very juggler vein in verse 26, yes, and even His own life. And how we become so many times, uh, we become self-focused, self-motivated, self-reliant. And Jesus said, you're going to have to love me more than you even love yourself. And he puts up his hands and he says, or you cannot be my disciple. You can still be a part of the crowd and walk on the perimeter, but you cannot be one of mine. That is the supreme devotion that our Lord calls for. And as graphic as it sounds, the greatest joy and the greatest pleasure in any person's life is to love the Lord Jesus Christ with all of their heart and all of their soul and all of their mind and all of their strength and to enter into a personal relationship with Christ where you talk with Him, where you walk with Him, where you fellowship with Him, where you commune with Him, it is the greatest experience in life. Now our Lord, in verse 27, goes yet further. And our Lord follows up with this statement in verse 27. Verse 26 is a supreme devotion. Verse 27, 27 is a self-denial. And Jesus understands how easy it is to be self-deceived when you are in the midst of a crowd, how easy it is to be a counterfeit disciple, how easy it is to be swept up in the moment of the larger crowds and to feel like, yeah, I guess I really am rightly connected with Christ, when in reality it is not so. So he follows up in verse 27 with yet another shocking statement. We have heard it said so many times and quoted so many times that it has really lost some of its thunder. But look at verse 27 and see what it says. Whoever, and when he says whoever, uh, that's like anyone in verse 26, that there is no other way, there are no other terms to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Whoever does not carry his own cross, and the emphasis here, his own, it is so individual, it is so personal. You can't carry anyone else's cross, and no one else can carry your cross for you. This is something that only you can do. This is a decision that only you can make. Whoever does not carry his own cross can come after me. It is an active faith. It is a dynamic faith. It is moving out, going with the Lord Jesus Christ. It is getting in step with the Savior and moving out in life. And as he says this, he is not speaking uh, of physically taking a step and moving out. He is talking about here spiritually within one's own heart and soul, the direction and the movement of your inner life. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me. And then Jesus repeats again at the end of verse 27 what he did at the end of verse 26. It is a double stop sign. It is a double blinking red light. He is calling us off at the landing. Can not be my disciple. Who are any of us here today to argue with the Savior about the terms that He sets for following Him? Who is any of us here today to try to soften or lessen what the Savior is saying? What does it mean to carry one's own cross? 
It certainly is not talking about wearing a necklace around your neck. It's, that's fine. No one in the Roman Empire in New Testament times, and certainly no one in Palestine, missed what our Lord was saying here because the cross symbolized the extremes of excruciating pain and a heartless cruelty that was always ending in death. To carry one's own cross was the dreaded death march, where one would stand before the judge's tribunal and be declared guilty as a criminal before the judge. And as a public display of one's own guilt, one would be forced to carry their own crossbar from the judgment seat all of the way to the site of execution. And it was publicly humiliating. And as one would carry their crossbar on their own shoulders, it was a public testimony of being under the submission of the higher authority of the judge. You are saying, I agree with the judge's condemnation of me, and I now yield my life and confess my, my guilt to having breached the law of the higher authority, and publicly and openly with all of the shame that is involved in the admission of my own guilt and sin, I now carry the crossbeam all the way to the point of the execution." And the streets of Jerusalem would be filled, and, and people would line up along the Via Della Rosa as the executed criminal, the condemned criminal, would carry his crossbeam. And everyone would see that Rome is in charge, and Rome has brought Judea into subjection and submission. And this is yet one more example of one who is under submission and is dying to self. This is precisely what Jesus is saying in verse 27. And what He is saying in verse 27 is that we must stand before the holiness of God in our own heart and agree with God's own estimation of us that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're just going to have to choke that down. And if we are to be saved, we must agree with that and come into a place of submission under the Lordship of Christ and come under the higher authority of Christ. And to carry one's own cross is to make an open and public statement to the world that I am guilty as charged before a holy God and my life has come under the government of God, and it has come under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, and I have come to the end of myself. I do not have a life anymore. And I am now dead to self and dead to sin, and I surrender my life to Jesus Christ, and I now am a follower of Jesus Christ, and I am carrying my cross every step of the journey as I follow Christ. And I am in submission to His Lordship, and I confess my sin, and I am willing to go wherever and whatever He calls me to do. It means to walk as He walked, to live as He lived, to speak as He speak as He spoke, to rejoice in what He rejoices in, and to weep over what He weeps over, because I am now one with Jesus Christ. I am now identified with Christ, and I am now a follower of Christ. And in Luke 9, verse 23, He puts it this way, if anyone shall come after me, he must deny himself and take up a cross and follow after me. That is what Jesus is saying here in Luke 14, 27. That is another way of saying, follow me. There are no qualifiers placed upon this 
statement. He will not tell us where He is leading us. He is not going to give us a five-year plan, a ten-year plan. All you need to know is Jesus Christ and to follow Him. He calls us to follow Him unconditionally. He calls us to follow Him in good times and in bad times. He calls us to follow Him volitionally and intentionally, solely, exclusively. There is no one else to follow. There is no other agenda for our life. There is no other purpose for our life, no other passion. Our entire life is centered on Jesus Christ. He is the sum and the substance of my life. And as I follow Him, I must follow Him step for step and stride for stride, and I must keep up the pace with Christ, and I cannot lag behind Him, and I cannot jolt ahead, but I must always stay in closest relationship and closest association with Christ. That is the issue at every point in the turn of life. Am I following Jesus Christ? And that's how we come into the kingdom, is by becoming a follower of Christ. And this is how I grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. I grow closer to Him, and I follow Him wherever He will lead me. And we cannot follow Christ in anything else. It is an all-or-nothing proposition. We cannot follow Christ and anything else. And I cannot follow Christ and love my job more than Christ. I cannot follow Christ and love school more than Christ. I cannot follow Christ and love uh, pleasures more than Christ. I cannot follow Christ and love this world more than Christ. What he is calling for here is absolute radical allegiance to Christ And it involves my own self-denial. And that's why the whole crowd never buys in. Because it calls for our own death. Listen, you can't live until you die. And you cannot live for Christ until you have died to self. There cannot be a resurrection until there is first a crucifixion. And there cannot be a resurrection unto life until there has been a crucifixion of your old life. I want to ask you very personally, I want to single you out in the midst of this crowd, whether you're up in the upper balcony, the middle balcony, or down here on the lower floor. I want to single you out within your own heart Have you taken up a cross in order to follow after Christ? Have you recognized your own sinfulness before a holy God in heaven? Have you acknowledged that God's judgment of you is true? Have you acknowledged the right of Christ to rule over your life? Have you surrendered and submitted your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ Have you really come to the end of self? Because Jesus does not begin until you end. This is the self-denial that He calls for, and how easy it would be to be a part of a religious crowd just like that crowd that followed after Christ and to be swept up in the moment, and to fail to individually die to self. It's so important, in fact, in verse 28, Jesus says that it calls for a sober calculation. No one just comes into this on a whim. The stakes are too high. It requires too much of you. And no one would just glibly take this up, Jesus calls for a sober calculation that every one of us would undertake in our own hearts and lives. And so, beginning in verse 28, Jesus gives two parables. You know what a parable is? It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. He paints two pictures upon the canvas of our minds so that we could see what it is that He is calling for. And rather than our Lord backing off on this and softening the terms, our Lord is actually upping the ante and saying, listen, don't buy into this yet. 
until you have really thought this through, because this will be the biggest decision of your life, and this will affect the entirety of your life for the rest of your life, and this will affect where you will spend all eternity. All the chips are on the table on this hand. You need to really count the cost. And so parable number one begins in verse 28. And he says, for which one of you, and when he says, for which one of you, he is looking into the eyes of the crowd, and he is sifting through those who have made a genuine commitment to Christ, and those who are really counterfeit disciples, those who are really just the curious, who are swept up into this movement. And so he says, for which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Any wise builder, no one would go into a building project without first having some idea of what this is going to cost me. How foolish it would be to just rush into a construction project, and then once you are into it, then scratch your head and give a second thought and go, wow, this really was far more than I ever initially thought about or really intended to take up. And then you begin to waffle, and then you begin to waver, and then you begin to pull back and then to pull away and go, you know, I'm just, my heart's really not into this, and determine not to finish because you don't want to ante up anymore. How easy it is to start something and how hard it is to finish something. How easy it is to launch into a project how costly it is to complete it. And so Jesus says in verse 29, otherwise, meaning if he does not count the cost, if you do not count the cost, when he has laid a foundation, so you've gotten into this, and this is someone again who has just made a, an easy decision for Christ and is not able to finish is not able to go all the way, all who observe it will begin to ridicule him. And you know what? And rightly so. Every time you walk down the street and you see that piece of property there at the corner, and you look and you see how everything had been cleared out, and the trees brought down, and the vines cleared out, and you see this foundation that has been laid, and you see the front door that is put on top of the foundation, but no nothing else ever surrounds the door and is put on top of the foundation. And day after day, after you walk past this, you look at this at this project, and you just chuckle on the inside, and you realize, and you say to yourself, this fool never really audited the cost. And how many people there are whose lives are just like that? And they may even come to a conference like this, and be swept up with the music, and swept up with the preaching, and swept up with the, 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 the genuine love that is being shown. And, and it's a, it, it is a feel-good place. And then begin to build, and you go back home, and you go, yeah, I need to do this some more. I need to go to church next week. And you go through all of this without ever making Jesus Christ number one in your life. And so you plug into a Bible study when you get back, and you begin to go through a few spiritual motions, and then pretty soon those old friends come around, and pretty soon those old temptations come, and you fall by the wayside. You are just like this man who began to build but never counted the cost that it will cost you everything to be a true follower of Jesus Christ and with resolve in your heart that you would have had to have crossed the line and burned the bridges behind you and there is no turning back and in your heart of hearts it is whatever it takes along the path I will give my life to Christ relentlessly. 
Let me tell you, you don't know what this will be in specifics next week and next month and even next year. But you need to make a sober calculation right now that it's going to cost you everything. It's going to determine who you marry. It's going to determine what kind of family you raise. It's going to determine what kind of work ethic you'll have. It's going to determine where you worship. It's going to determine really the following of all of the rest of your life. And nothing is outside of this commitment and your entire life lived under the Lordship of Christ. You need to think about that. And you need to weigh that in the balances of your mind so that you don't make a quick decision and go back home and fall away. Jesus then gives a second parable. He is the master teacher. He is the master expositor. And in verse 26 and in verse 27, He has played hardball with us. And He has every right to, for He has died for us, and He is Lord. And now in verses 28 and following, He paints these pictures, and in verse 31, He gives us the second parable. The first is, you need to weigh in on the cost factor and count the cost of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. It will cost you popularity. It will cost you promotion, perhaps, at times. It will cost you an easy life. You will have to discipline yourself. You will have to buffet your body. You will have to say no to temptation. You will have to say no to this world. You will have to break with the crowd. You will have to be willing to stand alone for Christ. You will have to be willing to walk to the beat of a different drummer and to to step out of the crowd, even if no one follows after Jesus Christ. You'd be willing to stand if you're the only person in the world for Jesus Christ. That's the cost factor. You would have to be willing to suffer persecution for Christ. And let me tell you, it will come. It might even cost you your life. But now the second parable in verse 31... And our Lord is like, he, he is like painting us into a corner where there is no way out but to surrender your life to Him. And with this second parable, the assumption is, well, what if you're not willing? What if you're not willing to pay the price? Is that going to be an easy way for you out? Are there any ramifications? Are there any implications? Are there any eternal implications for you if you don't step up to the table and say, yes, by the grace of God, I am willing to pay the price to be a disciple of Christ? And so in verse 31, Jesus said, or what king? When he sets out to meet another king in battle. We see the picture here. Here are two competing kingdoms. And here are two competing kings. And here are two competing armies. And only one will win, and the other will lose, and the one who loses will be slayed. The one who loses will be subjected for the rest of their days to slavery to the greater king. So there is a lot on the table here as to which king, or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider. And again, this is the counting of the cost. There needs to be contemplation and calculation. Whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000 men. And as he says this, he is saying to each of the people, you are this king with 10,000 soldiers, and you find yourself in a conflict. There is opposition that is being brought against you, and there is another king who is coming against your kingdom, and this other king has 20,000 
soldiers, and when you come into direct conflict with this coming, other coming king, he will utterly destroy you. He says in verse 32, this is the only reasonable decision to which you could come. Or else while the other is still far away, while this king with 20,000 fully armed soldiers that is marching against your kingdom with lesser defense, while the other king is still far away, any sane human being would respond thus. He sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. You don't want to meet this other king who is coming with 20,000 soldiers. He is not coming to play games. He is not coming to be docile. He is coming to dominate, and he is coming to slaughter. This other greater king is none other than the one who is telling the parable, for he is the king of kings, and he is the Lord of lords, and at the end of this age, he will bolt out of heaven on a white steed, and his garments are dripped in blood, the blood of his own enemies, and he is coming back to conquer and to damn. You need to make terms of peace with this coming king, or you will be subjected in damnation forever. And Jesus Christ has made terms of peace. You need to settle out of court with Him. You do not want to go into that final day of conflict with Christ. For he will be ruthless in the execution of his justice. But he offers you mercy today. He will agree to terms of surrender. He will agree to terms of peace. But they are his terms of peace, not ours. And his terms of peace are very simply this. You must hate your own father and mother and brother and sister and even your own life more than me, or you cannot be my disciple, and you must take up a cross and follow me, or you cannot be my disciple, and if you do not, you will meet me in the final judgment, and it will glorify God in your destruction." These are the two parables our Lord told. And in verse 33, He brings it to the bottom line. He brings it forward to the bottom line. He is the master evangelist. He's calling for the verdict. He's calling for the decision in your heart. He is pressing you for a decision. He will not be put off. You cannot hit the mute button any longer in your heart. You must answer to Him. In verse 33, so then, conclusion, none of you can be my disciple. He is saying, none of you can be a true Christian. None of you can be in my kingdom. None of you can be in right relationship with me or the Father. None of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. What is our Lord saying? He's not backing off. He is, he is increasing the commitment that he is calling for with every line of this section. Well, he's not saying that you have to buy your way into the kingdom of heaven, for none of us have enough gold and none of us have enough silver to ever remove the stain of sin that has defiled our inner soul. What is he saying? Who does not give up all of his own possessions? Well, this must be taken in 
context with other texts of Scripture, and let me just cut to the bottom line of the bottom line. You must transfer the ownership of all that you are and all that you have to all that He is. That's what He's saying. Your life is no longer your life, it is now His life. Your time is no longer your time, it is now His time. Your possessions are no longer your possessions, they are now His possessions. Your future is no longer your future, it is now His future. Your treasure is no longer your treasure, it is now His treasure, and you have transferred all that you are and all that you have to all that He is. That's what it is to meet His terms of peace. Someone has envisioned it this way, a conversation, someone wanting to buy a pearl from a pearl merchant. I want this pearl. How much is it? Well, the seller says, it's very expensive. How much? Well, a very large amount. Do you think I could buy it? Of course. Anyone can buy it. But you didn't you say it was very expensive? Yes. How much? Everything you have. And so we make up our minds. All right, I'll buy it. Well, what do you have? The merchant says. Let's write it down. Well, I have $10,000 in the bank. Good. $10,000. What else? Well, that's all. That's all I have. Nothing else. Nothing more. Well, I have a few dollars here in my pocket. How much? Well, let's see. Thirty, forty, fifty, sixty, hundred dollars, hundred and twenty dollars. That's fine. What else do you have? Well, nothing. That's all. Where do you live? Well, in my house. The house? You have a house? (laughs) Give me your house. And he writes down house. You mean I'm going to have to live in my camper? Oh, you have a camper. (laughs) I want your camper too. Well, if you do that, I'm going to have to sleep in my car. Oh, you have a car. Give me your car. Well, I I have two of them. (laughs) Well, you already have my money, my house, my camper, my cars. What more do you want? Are you alone in this world? Well, no, I have a wife and I have two children. Yes, I want your wife and your children. I have nothing left. I am all alone. Fine. Now you may have the pearl. That's something of what Jesus Christ is saying to you. Yet the exchange is not bartered or bought with real money but it is purchased with the total, complete surrender of your life to Christ. That's what saving faith is. It is coming to the end of yourself and completely and entirely entrusting all that you are and all that you have to all that He is. Finally, a searching examination, verse 34. And you would think at some point in this, Jesus would bring out the benefits, Jesus would soften up, Jesus would lighten up, Jesus... But you know what? This is too important. This is your eternal soul. This is the only life you will ever live. This deals with the only eternity you will ever have. And so our Lord says in verse 34, therefore, pulling everything forward from verse 26, therefore, salt is good. And yes, salt is good. It preserves good meat. It prevents spoiling. It imparts flavor. Salt is good, but even if salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? You see, we need to understand that not all salt is salt. And some salt has a mixture in it. Some salt in this part of the world had gypsum in it. And it will eventually show. It looks like salt, 
but it does not taste like salt, and it does not work like salt. It is a fake counterfeit salt. And what our Lord is with this metaphor is intending is to make the comparison between a true follower of Christ and a false follower of Christ, a true believer in the Lord, and one who is merely a part of the crowd. And so he says, salt is good, but if even salt has become tasteless, meaning it gives evidence that it was never true salt to begin with, with what will it be seasoned? And the answer is nothing. Verse 35, it is useless either for the soul or for the manure pile. It's just no good to anyone, not to God, not to Christ, not to the kingdom, not to the movement. You're just taking up a seat for someone else. There were other people who were trying to get into this. It is useless either for the soil. You're not even worth the toilet, spiritually speaking. Because you have not come to the place of total surrender of your life and supreme allegiance and supreme loyalty to Christ, you have not yet come under the lordship of Christ and taken up a cross to follow after Him. And then he says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. You need to give strictest attention to what God has said in His Son. For God has spoken in His Son to us in this conference. And God has brought every one of us to this place. Not a one of us is here by accident or by happenstance, and it is the goodness of God and the mercy of God that has brought you to this place where you have heard of Isaiah 53. You have heard of the suffering Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who upon that cross became sin for us. Upon that cross, He died to self that He might live for us and that He might bear our sins and iniquities upon that tree and purchase our salvation. And there is salvation in no other name, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And He is calling out to you today, come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will take you in and receive you unto myself. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls." For my burden is easy and my yoke is light. It is, it is. You will have the weight of sin lifted off of you. And you will have now the yoke of Christ upon you. And He gets into that yoke with you. And He pulls with you. But it will require the total commitment of your life to Him. Oh, how we ought to search our hearts here today. Have I come to this place of total commitment in my life? Have I yielded my life to the sovereign lordship of Him who died upon the cross for me? I want you to know that the gates of paradise have been swung open to you And the narrow gate is open, and if you will take a step of faith and come through this narrow gate and commit your life to Him, despite the strength of His words, He also says, Him who comes unto me I will in no wise cast out. He is calling you today to come, to come to Him to take a step of faith and to come to Him. But if you come to Him, don't play games. You must surrender to Christ. Someone has written the following, and I close with this, entitled, I Am a Disciple. The die has been cast, I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. 
I will not look up, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, plaudits, or popularity. I don't have to be right, first, tops, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith, love by patience, lift by prayer, and labor by power. My pace is set. My gate is fast. My goal is heaven. My road is narrow. My way is rough. My companions few. My guide reliable. My mission clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, deterred, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice. I will not hesitate in the presence of adversity. I will not negotiate at the table of the enemy. I will not ponder at the pool of popularity, nor meander in the maze of mediocrity. I will not give up, back up, let up, or shut up until I have prayed up, preached up, stored up, and stayed up the cause of Christ. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I must go until He returns, give until I drop, preach until all know, and work until He comes. And when He comes to get His own, He will have no trouble recognizing me. My colors are flying high, and they are clear for all to see. Are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? It will cost you everything. Let us pray. Father, we thank You for a Savior who tells it like it is. We thank You for a Savior who speaks straight words. We thank You for a Savior who has undertaken our salvation and entirely purchased it on His own. We thank You for a Savior who has carried our sins far, far away and who has sprinkled the mercy seat with His blood and has appeased Your righteous anger. We thank You for a Savior who has reconciled us to Yourself. We thank You for a Savior who issues invitations and who issues summons and calls. We thank You for a Savior who has thrown open the gates of paradise that we might enter in and be a true bona fide disciple in His kingdom. We thank You that it means something to be a disciple, that it's not a mere tag-along follower disconnected from the Savior. We thank You that You require the complete and total sacrifice and surrender of our lives to King Jesus. And Father, we are aware of who we are and what we are, and we are this King with 10,000 soldiers, and God forbid that we not make terms of peace with Him, for He is coming, the King is coming, and He is coming with 10,000 of His angels. And He will destroy His enemies and cast them into the bottomless pit where there is the weeping and the gnashing of teeth forever and ever, and rightly so. Father, thank You that through the cross, He beckons us and He calls us to Himself. And so, Lord, we count the cost. We examine ourselves. We agree with Your verdict of us that we are guilty as charged, and we come under that verdict and take that crossbeam and embrace the Lord Jesus Christ and now step into this long line of followers, and we follow after Christ. Lord, we don't look to the left or to the right to see who else follows or does not follow. We care not for what others will say or not say. We simply desire Christ and to be rightly related to Him. And Lord, I pray that in this moment, in this hour, there would be many who would cross the line. There would be many who would cross over from darkness to light, from just the crowd 
to being a true disciple of Christ. I pray that many would cross over from unbelief to true saving faith, that many would cross over from the world through repentance and live for another world to come. Father, thank You that You would interrupt our lives with the truth of Your Word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.